Hello and welcome to Med City News' Invest Conference. My name is Orundhuti Parmar and I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Med City News. So we are going to talk about clinical trial diversity and improving patient access to affordable drugs. America is a deeply heterogeneous society, yet the populations that participate in clinical trials is woefully not as diverse. This has significant implications for how different drugs impact and interact with different types of bodies. That is a concern for before drugs are approved by the FDA. But even after, the question of patient access comes up. If life-saving drugs and life-enhancing drugs are too expensive, who does it really benefit? Both the issue of clinical trial diversity and patient access to affordable drugs are important to the discussion of health equity and patient empowerment. And our expert panel today will be discussing this at great length. So let me go ahead and introduce that panel to you. Our moderator today is Ambor Bhattacharya. He is the Managing Director at Maverick Ventures. At Maverick, Ambor has led investments in a number of companies, including Artemis Health, Caribou Biosciences, Centivo, CityBlock Health, Collective Medical Technologies, Concerto Health AI, Devoted Health, Docent Health, Hims and Hers, Homology Medicines, and Notable Health. Prior to joining Maverick, Ambor was a vice president at Bessemer Venture Partners. During his tenure, seven portfolio companies that he sourced and or was a board observer on went public or were successfully acquired. Welcome to you, Ambor. Alison Kalu is a patient recruitment specialist. She's the founder of Clinical Ambassador, I Participate, and Clini Vivre aimed at expanding minority access and impacting diversity, equity, and inclusion in clinical research. She formerly held various positions in the pu private, public, and nonprofit health sectors. Her agency also works with clients to support the success of their clinical studies through mock trials and customized patient interviews to forecast compliance and completion. She is now one of the newest members of the Medieval Patient Advisory Council. Allison is a graduate of the Madeira School, North Carolina Central University, and Yale School of Public Health. Welcome, Allison. Doug Langa is the Executive Vice President of North America Operations and President of Novo Nordisk. Since, since March 2017, Doug has held full business responsibility for Novo Nordisk's largest sales region, the US and Canada, representing more than half of global revenue and more than 6,000 employees. Under his leadership, Novo Nordisk has launched five new products in the US and implemented a completely new operating model. Doug first joined Novo Nordisk in 2011 as the senior director, managed markets, where he was responsible for strategy development and ex execution across the diabetes portfolio. Previous positions include senior director of pair marketing at GlaxoSmithKline, as well as various roles of increasing responsibility at J&J. He graduated from Widener University, earned his MBA from Fordham University, and holds professional certificates from the Wharton School and Harvard Business School. Welcome to you, Doug. Cynthia Wurst is president of design and delivery innovation for the research and development solutions organization at IQVIA. Before joining IQVIA, Cynthia served as president of real world and late phase research at Quintiles. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 2014, she was named one of the top women in biotech by Fierce Biotech publication. She currently sits on the boards of Q2 Solutions, ACRO, and DIA. Cynthia began her career in biopharma at Procter & Gamble Pharmaceuticals. She holds a doctorate and bachelor's degree in pharmacy from the University of Cincinnati, a master's degree in structural and cellular biology from the University of Illinois, and bachelor's degree in biology and chemistry from Northern Kentucky University. Welcome to you, Cynthia. Carrie Williams is VP and partner at McKesson Ventures. She brings over 15 years of healthcare expertise from several vantage points within the healthcare industry. Her investments include Evidation Health, Conesca Health, Lambert Vet Supply, Propeller Health, and Zelf. 
Prior to joining McKesson Ventures, she served as Vice President Strategy and Business Development for Omada Health, where she focused heavily on all elements of commercial strategy and partnerships. She began her career in drug development, managing oncology clinical trials in big pharma and biotech. Carrie holds an MBA from the Haas School of Business at the University of California at Berkeley and a BS in biology from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Welcome to you, Carrie. And I wanted to also thank Carrie and McKesson for sponsoring this panel today. Before I turn it over to Ambar, I wanted to um, explain to the audience that the panel would love to hear questions. So please put them in the chat and Ambar will weave them in where appropriate. Please take it away, Ambar. Thanks so much. Um, uh, and really happy to be here and talking about uh, this really important topic. It's, it's near and dear in my heart. And uh, as, as we were just hearing the bios of the people who are here, I'm, I'm just thrilled to not just moderate the panel, but also just to learn um, uh, a lot more about how folks at Big Pharma, um, you know, uh, leading CROs, folks who are patient advocates, uh, companies like McKesson are, are really at the forefront of thinking about increasing diversity, increasing affordability for, uh, you know, for, for drugs and, and, and for clinical trial recruitment. And so I think a good way to kick off would be just getting the lay of the land in terms of where things stand today in terms of diversity in clinical trials and what, you know, where, you know, where, where things were five years ago, where they are today. Um, and I think we, this is a good time to just get to know some of the panelists as well. So may, maybe we'll just go in order um, and uh, I'll pick on Carrie first, you know, as you're, you're staring at me and may, maybe give us a lay of the land of where, where you know, because you, you, you yourself used to actually be on the ground helping run clinical trials. So maybe weave that in into helping people understand how things used to work and where things are. Sure. So good to see everyone. And thanks for the question, Ambar. So I think a lot of the potential for what change can be is what I'm feeling today. I think there's a lot that hasn't changed yet. Um, frankly, my experience as a clinical trial manager, someone who had to help write the protocol and think about how to identify patients for the trial and recruit them in, then retain them, all of those same themes seem to be persistent when I speak to individuals still working on the front lines here around clinical trials and all of these operational dimensions. What I do think has changed and what gives us a lot of excitement on the team within McKesson and a lot of our peers is the power of data, the power of using tech to engage those who may not be right at a hub, right at an academic medical center um, to do the classic research participation where there's brick and mortar expectations on all of the patients. Um, and then just the, the receptivity I think we're seeing, particularly with the momentum behind, I think, telemedicine um, and what we've seen in this past year, the acceptance that a lot of what is typically or had typically been done in an in-person setting can be done just as effectively, if not more so, in the home setting or even in the community setting. And just being more creative, yet still highly compliant and regulatory grade and the approaches to different trial designs. So whether it's fully decentralized, hybrid of some sort, collecting more data um, in the context of the trial to maybe offset their in-person requirements. I think all of that gives us a lot of optimism for what's to come. And we've certainly seen that a lot of players are not only in the market um, bringing new solutions, but that big pharma and, and a lot of the other biotech players have been very much open to exploring ways to embrace these new technologies and solutions. So. Lots of optimism here, um, but still some of the same recurring themes. And I think hopefully today we'll be discussing where we can go and how collaboration together across all these different parts of the market um, can help us get beyond just optimism and some momentum to real results. Uh, th thank you, Kerry. Uh, you mentioned Big Pharma, so that's a, that's a good segue to Doug um, and, and all the stuff he's done both at Novo and, uh, and before that at GSK. But Doug, why, why don't you give your perspective? You've been an industry veteran for a while. Um, you know, talk about how you've seen how you've seen this transition over the course of time, and where do you think the you know the, the the state of affairs is today? Yeah, thank you, uh, Ambar, and it's uh, great to be here, especially with this panel, and uh, looking forward to it. I would say the game is changing for sure. I think when we think about the expectation now of pharma, um, we have international regulators, including the FDA, that are expecting pharma companies to enroll participants who reflect the demographics for clinically relevant populations. 
with regard to things like ethnicity and race and age and gender. So those are now almost becoming the table stakes of what's expected of us. You know, unfortunately, despite this, the challenges and participation in trials, they still remain today. And certain groups continue to be underrepresented in many, many trials. So this has to change. And I can tell you that at Novo Nordisk, uh, we take this very seriously and, and we are encouraging diverse uh, representation of patients. And that trial participation is still a key component of a Novo Nordisk, what we consider a patient-centered business approach. So I think the game is changing, the expectations are changing. And I think that all of us, uh, throughout you know, the, the value chain, including big pharma, uh, need to step up. Makes sense, and, and, and I appreciate that perspective. Uh, you know, one of the key relationships in all of pharma is between you know, pharma and pharma companies and CROs, and it's a good, good, good way to introduce uh, Cynthia here, who uh, works at IQVIA. You know, Cynthia, you, I'd be curious for your, your perspective here as well in terms of how you know, how IQVIA um, has, is thinking about this challenge and how the demands that you're, that you're hearing from your customers are also changing. Yeah, indeed. And thank you, Ambar. Uh, you know, Doug said it extremely well uh, in so much as, you know, the climate is changing and, and we sense that the pace of change or the rate of change is actually increasing. And if there's any silver lining to COVID-19, uh, clearly, the recognition and renewed focus and urgency around the diversity in clinical trials, uh, that is the silver lining relative to COVID-19. And you know, what we've come to appreciate, as Doug mentioned, you know, uh, regulators are really the epidemiologic representative, representativeness of the disease states where regulatory affairs uh, agents around uh, the U.S. U in the EU and bringing that requirement and not so much, uh, you know, recommendation, but we're seeing that being an agitator and no doubt a motivator uh, for big pharma and emerging uh, biotechs to actually encourage that uh, representativeness in, in clinical trials. So I too am encouraged on this front, you know, as the environment is shaping, as there is more coalescence and collaboration on this front across um, associations, regulators, uh, pharma, uh, CROs, et cetera. And I think that's really what it's gonna take to really get this uh, moving at the pace that it is uh, quite frankly um, required uh, in order to move the needle on this front. And you know, I think too, uh, and Carrie said it extremely well, you know, it will take the good news is the, the innovation, the decentralized trials, getting the, the, the ability to reach out into the communities and being able to access diverse populations. And of course, accessing uh, diverse investigators and through digitalization, through advanced analytics and the use of real world evidence uh, together I think is really giving us um, optimism that indeed uh, changes are afoot. Makes sense. That, that, that's great. And uh, I wanted to turn it over to Allison too. So one of the stakeholders that is, um, you know, that is, uh, you know, we always talk about, but often doesn't make the panel, doesn't make the boardroom, doesn't make, you know, that the contract negotiation is the patient. Um, and, and Allison has done has done a great job in terms of you know, thinking through that. So Allison, I'd, I'd love your perspective on kind of where, same question, the lay of the land, where things were five, 10 years ago and where things are now. And, you know, what are some of the shifts that you're seeing from, from, from your perspective? Thanks, Ambar. Um, thank you very much for having me as well. As we all know, there are abundant statistics from the CDC, the NIH, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Kaiser Family Foundation, a litany of many other renowned institutions, not to mention scientific literature describing the problem of lack of diversity in clinical trials. And this dates back decades now. It also runs in parallel to health disparities among black and brown people across the US. In fact, underrepresentation among minority populations in clin clinical trials has been a persistent problem and the Achilles heel in research. 
the pandemic has simply shown a glaring light on it. And in that regard, um, I guess you could say that I too am, am thankful for silver linings. But for even sharper context, in fact, the last time I checked, about one quarter, roughly 25% of drugs listed on the FDA's drug trial snapshot reported having had enough data on minority stu um, study participants to report that data. For, in other words, for roughly 75% of drugs approved by the FDA, the fine print actually reads, not enough data on minorities to report, meaning that there were not enough minority participants to make the data statistically significant. And let's pause for a second to really appreciate what that means. The vast majority of drugs approved have and will be prescribed to treat conditions for which minorities actually overrepresent, for which there is disproportionate disease burden for black and brown people. And yet they are being prescribed nonetheless, which kind of makes it seem like a crapshoot. So for no, I, me, <laughs> no other sets of, fact, of facts more brilliantly underscore the need for a reckoning in clinical trials than this disconnect. Because right. these data from the FDA get to where the efforts and the solutions have been in the past. These data measure the response of industry to health disparities. More broadly speaking, this disconnect makes alarming predictions, if unchecked, about the capacity of our nation's healthcare system to respond adequately to the needs of its patients of color. After all, what is equitable access to healthcare without equitable representation in clinical trials first? It simply, simply cannot exist. This yeah, is the basis for equitable access to evidence-based medicine. Nothing better illustrates the obligation and the opportunity or the fact that this is ultimately another social justice issue. We simply have work to do. Thankfully, I'm solution oriented and solutions are at hand. So come on in the workshop. Yeah, that's great. No, I, I think it's, it's very well summarized in terms of why we're all here, right? The audience members, us as panelists, is that the, the, the problem set is, is, is vast and uh, the, the way you quantified it is excellent. And so, so I appreciate you, you doing that. I, I do want to turn to the solution set in a moment. I think uh, Carrie and, uh, you know, talked about just centralized trials and I want to hit on that. Uh, Cindy talked about real world evidence. Um, it, the voice of the patient is important here. I do, I do want one, just want to focus one more time on, on, on how things happen. We talked about this a little bit in our pre-panel session, which is trying to understand, you know, what, what is the root cause of, of some of these issues in terms of, um, in terms of enrollment, um, the lack of enrollment of, of, of minorities in clinical trials. And, and, and oftentimes, uh, you know, you, you turn towards societal issues, sometimes you turn to dollars and cents and, you know, you try to understand, gosh, like, is it actually more expensive to, to recruit a diverse set of, of patients to a clinical trial. And I, I think it's just worth addressing that, you know, kind of head on, right, for a second. Um, and we'd, we'd love to turn it over to, to folks, you know, Cynthia and Doug, maybe maybe start with, with either of you to talk about, hey, from an economic perspective, you know, is, is, is this part of the issue? And then we could talk about the solutions, about how the solutions might address this, this topic. So maybe, Cynthia, I'll, I'll start with you from the IQVF perspective. Sure thing. Uh, so I'll, I'll answer those in the order that you posed them. And that is, you know, why are we here? Why are we having these conversations? And clearly it's multifaceted, uh, as Allison was, was highlighting. And, and I think that uh, the, you know, what are the barriers and, and double clicking, firstly, on what are those individual barriers and then, of course, establishing the remediation based on those root causes. And none of us can deny that trust um, is a huge lever um, in terms of barrier and, and being able to ensure that we are indeed putting you know, those solutions that we'll talk about in a moment uh, to the very forefront uh, in order to get after remediation efforts. 
And so when contemplating, you know, how do we take those uh, barriers and, and address them in, in very uh, head on modalities? I think it's going to, the remediation efforts are going to really uh, net, net out that collaboration and commitment is going to be absolutely required in terms of trying to understand if, in fact, uh, you know, trust, if that's the, the barrier, how do we uh, get into these community-based diverse investigators, for instance, and being able to invest and, and put forward a sustainable infrastructure to help, in fact, uh, um, dial up and encourage more investigator, diverse investigator participation as an example of being able to address the trust factor. And again, multifaceted. I, I would say to answer your question quickly, Ambar, regarding cost, is that an impediment in terms of the time and the cost associated with the access and the enrollment of diverse populations? You know, I would say, you know, the, at, at any point in time, all of us involved in clinical research, any time that you are looking for a particular segment or a particular cohort, be that demography, racial, ethnicity, it will add complexity and cost, no doubt about it. Um, however, what I will underscore is that if there is pre-planning, a priori planning, regarding the patient voice at the outset, protocol development, and very deliberate planning on operationalization, it certainly will reduce costs quite significantly as compared to, and we've learned this uh, in, in many instances and not the least of which in COVID-19 vaccine development, that it is very costly to bring in diversity in clinical trials when that trial is in flight. Doug, over to you. Thanks, Cynthia. And you know, we, as an organization, are not collecting data specifically on the cost, but, but maybe on board, I can talk to at least some of the barriers because I think this group is well aware of, of many, and maybe I'll just talk about a few because the inverse is probably some of the solutions or things that we can do. But when we think about, you know, even from a farmer perspective, broadening some of the el eligibility criteria um, to open up trials to, to more diverse patients or maybe reduce, reducing the, un, the unnecessary patient burden, which is travel time or some financial components of that, which, which may impact the diverse population more. Are we doing enough to work in communities, um, diverse communities to address uh, you know, the variability of patient needs, um, which involves not only the patients, their advocates, potentially caregivers, um, you know, things of this nature. And, and I think we need to consider those communities because they're very, very important. You know, are we ensuring that the clinical trial sites, so specifically their geographic locations, are they in a higher concentration of, of racially and ethnically diverse patient areas? And, and if they're not, why not? So, you know, and then maybe lastly, um, you know, we can make more, make, make the events more accessible and hosting them in communities. And again, I'll mention that word communities because I think it is really, really important or maybe trusted locations, possibly places of worship worship or things of this nature. So, you know, the inverse is we could probably do more of those, but, but again, I think we're starting out with some of the hurdles, at least uh, through the lens that we're looking at. No, I think, I think it's, really, it's really well said. And I think, and thank you both for hitting it dead on, right? I think you, there's, there's a laundry list of things both of you have said um, that, that have been, um, Certainly, certainly at the part of the root cause of, of this issue, I think Doug, you said it very well. There, there's an inverse side of all of these things that you just talked about, and ways that we can approach um, solving these problems, right? And we're not going to do that here on this panel today, but I, but I think we can talk about other things that are in flight, in motion, and some of the things that we want to see in motion too. Um, you know, Carrie, a few moments ago, you you talked about the concept of decentralized trials. Why, why don't we start there? and talk about how, how clinical trials used to be run. Maybe not everyone is familiar with a hybrid trial or decentralized trial. Maybe, maybe give folks the lay of the land of how that works. And in particular, how a decentralized trial or hybrid trial, trial structure addresses some of the issues that Cynthia and Doug just talked about. Absolutely. Yeah, so much of this is, it's as much about finding patients and engaging them, building that trust, as it is about having a study that is recruitable and it's possible to retain the patient, one that is feasible for the patient to participate in, depending on what barriers they might be managing through. So 
the classic clinical trial when I was doing this 15 plus years ago was brick and mortar, kind of thinking about walking into a clinic or walking into, as we call it, an investigator site. So the sponsor, maybe in collaboration with the CRO, is trying to identify hotspots, you know, in the country or in, in a range of countries where they think there's prevalence of the condition and patients who will meet all those eligibility criteria that, that Doug was referring to. There has been, I think, some meaningful improvement and players who've been doing quite a good deal of work with real world data to better understand in a more dynamic fashion who are the patients that are out there with all these attributes we've discussed around demographics, race, ethnicity, plus their clinical factors to determine if they could theoretically be eligible for the trial. And I think we'll get better and better at being able to identify those patients. So the question then turns to how do we both engage them, build that trust, and engage them in a study that is possible for them to participate in. And what I'm referring to there is really the schedule of events as we, we talk about in a protocol. What are the required visits or interventions or interactions that are part of that study design to ultimately be able to answer the questions that are being asked about that drug that's being studied? What are the primary and secondary endpoints? The classic kind of you know, model that I was working in was you found those investigators, you found the patients that wanted to go to that site once a week for however many weeks or months or multiple times a week, sometimes spending an entire day at a site to be screened. And that translates into who has the ability to spend that time to do all those activities. So this concept of a decentralized or a hybrid trial is to what extent can some, of some if not all, of those study-related procedures be done in a different setting other than a patient traveling to a, a site. That might mean most of the visits still need to be done at the site, but some could be done in the home setting. Or some, most could be done in the home setting, but some one or two might need to happen in the investigator site, you know, investigator's office. Or there's a third dimension here. What can we bring into the community where there is trust, where there is access, where there may actually be existing relationships? the pharmacy, a more local imaging center, a, a, another type of lab or clinic um, for diagnostic testing, if it can't be done in the home setting through home-based technologies or, or solutions. So I could talk about this a lot longer, but I just wanted to throw out some of those concepts of the creativity I think that we can start to play around with and be more configurable in some of these designs. And certainly there are players in the market today trying to work through what are these right elements we can bring together to get up the convenience. Players like Lightship, um, Science37, Medible are certainly ones that many of us have probably heard of or working with closely. Um, and then others that are really focused on you know, remote data capture, players like Evidation, players like um, Clinical Inc. Um, and again, back to Medible where it's possible to tap into the patient's kind of day in, day out, um, you know, lot, day in, day out life. Uh, to, to collect relevant data for the study. Uh, I'll stop there. No, that, that, that's wonderful. I think you defined it very, very well and talked about some of the virtues of this. Um, you mentioned Medible a few times. I was going to go to Allison uh, right after this anyways, but yeah, Allison, I was, I was going to frame it in the way that, you know, you're on a patient advisory council, right? And, you know, you're, you're working with some of these, uh, some, some of these uh, companies, institutions, you've seen it. Of the things that you've seen in the innovative world, you know, and things that are helping solve this problem, what, what have you been most impressed by? You know, what, what are you excited to sink your teeth into of, gosh, like if this could actually, you know, gain some more momentum uh, from, from a solution oriented perspective, you know, this could actually have a real impact. What, what have you seen in your experience? The thing that jumps to mind um, most obviously for me is being able to put patients and caregivers um, into the conversation and shining a light on their perspectives. So working closely with Medible has brought decentralized trials and all of the potential for greater efficiency into sharper focus for me. But what makes them a great partner is that they actually acknowledge the critical importance of humanizing the process and not stripping away the human element. And for communities of color in particular, who have been treated as less than human in the past, ensuring this balance could not be more critical. Efficiency and telehealth interactions are great, but we have to reach people first. Minority patients 
may need more reassurances than most um, that we will be treated equitably, justly, respectfully. And after all, what good are efficiencies if the patient cohort you seek to engage does not enroll? Well said, very well said. Cynthia, I know that you, you've given some thought to this from the IQV perspective. I, I would, I'm curious for all the initiatives that you're doing and where, where you see that groundswell of innovation uh, 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 taking the company. Yeah, indeed. And we see this tectonic shift, right, of uh, CROs in, in our pharma sponsor community of actually moving away from developing programs for patients to the mindset of, of developing programs with patients. And as the panel has highlighted, you know, being able to use innovative approaches like digitalization, like precision analytics, predictive analytics, real world evidence, and, and being able to bring those patient insights, the, the voice uh, of the patient before, during, and in fact, after the clinical trial participation by way of digitalizing in a scalable and in a, uh, a manner that allows these insights to be surfaced uh, very urgently, rapidly. And, and in fact, we are developing uh, digital capabilities that are, there, that are very orchestrated with our decentralized trial technology capabilities, meaning that we're going directly uh, to patients. As Carrie mentioned, you know, the days are gone of the brick and mortar and us relying so heavily on that investigator. We're trying, trying to reduce the friction, meaning that we're going directly to uh, patients in the community. A as Doug highlighted, you know, we're, we're moving away from those academic, sole academic sites into the communities where the patients are, the diverse patients, and being able to, through digital means, bringing them into clinical trials, but essentially also offering means for bi-directional feedback during trials and being able to give them proper, their study results back during the, the, the trial itself to help encourage that trust, to help, you know, and, and, and in fact, at the end of the trial, being able to provide plain language summaries back to patients so that they understand how and why this trial is meaningful to them and to others in the community. So digitalization, uh, again, the, the ability to leverage in unison the triangulation of real world evidence uh, technology as, as well as of course, advanced analytics and that machine learning. I think the, the machine getting smarter and smarter is helping us to reduce cost uh, and in fact, um, reduce timelines and reducing burden on patients and investigators alike. I, I think you know, I, Ambar, if you want, I can give a uh, I can give a farmer perspective. On yeah, the I was going to well, well, Doug, I, I, I was I was going to ask you actually wearing two hats because I, I know you you have you have many hats that you wear, but one I was going to ask you for for the pharma perspective from 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 a, from a Novo Nordisk perspective, but also I know I know you're on the board of Pharma actually, you know the the industry group, and so. Would love for you to actually hit on hit on it from the farmer perspective in terms of what you're what you're seeing and frankly what you're demanding of your CRO partners right in terms of you know leveraging some of these decentralized techniques the real world evidence data techniques you know and where that is today like what inning are we in frankly but two then then two you know we, we can transition to as an industry not just from you as a as a corporate leader but as an industry what what do you think the industry is doing. Yeah, let me let me put my pharma hat on first and say decentralization is there's certainly optimism around that and the potential of decentralizing clinical trials and it, and it could decrease patient burden as I talked about earlier. We could further encourage uh, diversity of patients to consider participating in the clinical trial. So I think there's a lot of promise there. And, and we ourselves as a company, we're currently piling our first virtual uh, um, decentralized clinical trial on diabetes in Denmark. And we've made some investment in technologies like wearables. And so uh, I, I do believe that there's some promise, but there's also some barriers and barriers that we acknowledge. And one of them is collecting data remotely that is potentially a challenge. So how do we do that accurately? And how do we do that uh, remotely? And the other is uh, distributing product directly to patients remotely. Again, that is a bit of a challenge for us in the industry. But the concept of bringing the trial to the patients is really appealing. And especially when we think about rare diseases and uh, 
And, and so I, I think there's excitement, but there's probably some hurdles and things we need to get over. Uh, yes, I'm, I do sit on pharma. I have for many years. And for those that don't know pharma, it's a trade organization that represents the, the leading uh, pharmaceutical con companies in the country. And these are innovative bi bio uh, pharmaceutical research companies. In essence, there's got to be a degree of, of research uh, and development to be a member of pharma. And it's about discovering and developing medicines in essence. And this is the trade group. Just recently, it was actually just last week, pharma did publish the first ever industry-wide principles on clinical trial diversity. So perfect. Um, which is a new chapter that's been added to the already existing principles on the conduct of clinical trials and the communication of cl clinical trial results. And not to get into a lot of detail, but I can give you the four uh, focus areas. And one was, and I, and I believe it was uh, Cynthia um, that may have mentioned it earlier, but this element of trust. So the first pillar or, or area is building trust and acknowledging some of the ran, ran wrongdoing, excuse me, of the past. And I think that's always important if we're gonna move forward is we have to acknowledge some of the wrongdoings of the past. We have to, and it's been mentioned before, reduce the barriers to access. And then we need to, the third pillar is using real world data to enhance information on diverse populations beyond just the approval. And then lastly, it's sharing success and failures amongst the pharmaceutical companies. So working together in essence um, within the organization to, to get better. So those are sort of the four pillars and they were announced last week. So it is exciting and, and they are uh, putting a stake in the ground in essence uh, from a trade organization, which represents the leading companies in pharma. No, that, that makes sense. Um, I, I wanna go back to something you said at first, Doug, and get, get other folks um, perspective on this too, which is, 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 you know, as an investor, this is something we think about. We, we not just, we try not to think just about the themes that are, are happening, but also the timing of them, right? And so uh, a lot of conversation today about virtual trials and decentralized trials and how much, uh, you know, how much hope they hold for help solving this issue at the same time, it's it's early days, right? You know, in, in terms of you know big pharma adopting this, you know, CROs really leveraging this, um, and you know, and in, in some ways, you know, uh, Allison's stat that she said at the beginning, you know, is kind of lingers, right? You know, seventy five percent of drugs, you know, are you know have have that fine print about not having necessarily the right diversity, um, you know, in that clinical trial enrollment. You know, as we think about the timing for some of this, you know, adoption. Um, you know, what, what, what's the catalyst for it? Is, is this enough of, is this, you know, the, this moment that we're in, in 2021, is this enough of a moment for this to catalyze, to be a top issue here, to push forward more decentralized trials, or is there a way to think about how, you know, the, the, the majority of trials work today, which is still, you know, centralized and through the traditional brick and mortar that Carrie used to work in, you know, a decade ago, um, you know, is there a way to adjust those, you know, you, you know, and, but keep in mind some of those elements you just talked about, Doug, from, from the pharma perspective, you know, and building trust and, you know, communicating better and all, all these things that are very hard to disagree with. Um, you know, I'd love to comment on, on the timing of this and what you, what do you think the catalysts are from any, anyone's perspective? Uh, I would highlight if, if I might, um, step out here, um, not interrupting my colleagues, uh, but I, I would say one other, and, and there are probably several um, good components or silver linings of COVID-19. You know, I've been in the industry about three decades and I have never in my career seen so much collaboration in the healthcare ecosystem. And I see this as a true catalyst that is helping us to drive the adoption of these orchestrated technologies and, and the digitalization and, and other innovation vehicles. And I think as this consortium, you know, Doug mentioned pharma. I, I, I have the honor of sitting on the board of the Association of Clinical Research Organizations. And in fact, for the first time since this, this uh, trade association has been um, in existence, we are now outpaced by technology members of ACRO and the CRO and, and the tech uh, industry has never been more collaborative with pharma, with bio, 
another trade association, Transcelerate, which um, I'm sure Doug um, will highlight is another very important consortium. And of course, coming together, we have approached the regulators, FDA, together, hand in hand, you know, on many of these innovative approaches, decentralized trials, diversity, uh, et cetera, and being unified and having a collective voice, I think is one such catalyst on bar that's really going to help us with this pace of adoption in changing diversity in clinical trials. Thank, thank you for that. Allison, I'm curious, I'm curious for your opinion here too, and how you, how you see, you know, how you see catalysts, uh, you know, that, that you've seen from, from the patient perspective. Sure. Well, from my perspective, real reform nationwide will require more than episodic solutions. It requires a mandate for systemic solutions. And we need changes to federal policies that have allowed this problem to languish as long as it has. We need collaborations like mine with Medable to ensure shared goal setting. For us, engaging with participants of color was not the barrier. It's never been the barrier. This was not where we met obstacles. It was not an uphill climb, basically because my people were not resistant to the message. No, it has always been because the industry had not until now fully engaged or made themselves good and trustworthy partners. We need to get to the point where diversity, equity, and inclusion are not something we do, but something we are. I believe, as my colleagues have echoed, that strategic partnerships can produce those sea changes. That's well said. And you brought up DEI, which I know is a important initiative across the board for everyone. Um, I'm, I'm curious for whether it's uh, Carrie, Cynthia, Doug, um, you know, given Allison brought it up, how, how have you seen the intersection of DEI initiatives at your firms and this topic of clinical trial diversity? Have, have, how, how has that intersection been and how do you think that's playing a role here? I would, you know, highlight the true desire to bring in more diversity from an investment perspective and investor perspective. So even if the company isn't a fit for our portfolio, what else can we do to bring that more diverse background, perspective, entrepreneur, you know, specifically into the, into the fold, make the right introductions, keep them top of mind, and make sure that we're looking at and considering an, a truly representative um, set of companies and, and CEOs who are bringing their unique and very important perspectives to this, this opportunity. Our, our fund focuses very heavily on the biopharma space, both the clinical and the commercial side. And so we've really um, put a, a laser focus on keeping this top of mind because some of, you know, while we've talked about some more of the very established consortiums, there are also emerging players that we've highlighted that we need to have every element of the trial process have this lens consistently on diversity not just when it's convenient, not just, you know, for that particular customer or when it's convenient for the sale they're trying to make. So if you think about all the elements that come into play here around using data for trial design, thinking about patient recruitment tactics and patient engagement tactics and techniques to build that trust we've already talked about. Even I think about the consent process. Yes, it's wonderful. We can do e-consent now and have that process be easy. But what's the flip side of that? Maybe there are some parts of that potential target population that do need that person to sit down with them in an even more you know, deliberate fashion than had been in the past to help them understand what they're really signing up for, know that they have their partnership and advocacy. So Doug sort of alluded to it too, but my mind was going to, we need to keep the lens on no matter what. We need to make sure we're, we're working with partners that have diversity at top of mind. And then make sure we don't go too far into the digital or too far into the tech enabled where that human relationship is just so imperative. I, and I couldn't help but think about my Almada days there. We, we were never tech only um, and that company won't be because you need to know when to dial up or dial back depending on what that person needs in that moment to feel safe and motivated to act. It makes a lot of sense. 
And Bob, if I could just maybe spend... add one thing to what Allison said, because it, it, I, when you asked about the timing, I think the timing is now, but, but I do agree that, you know, systematic change is, is really imperative. I mean, the pharma guidelines are a really good start, but I think that, you know, we need to continue to work together. This is across patients, patient advocacy, advocacy group, regulators, regulated authorities, healthcare practitioners, academia, policymakers, I think was also mentioned by, by Allison. So I think it's important that, that we all come together and, and maybe just one note on de and I from, from our perspective, certainly we, we've got to improve, improve the clinical trial, but we're also doing it holistically at Nova Nordisk. And, you know, we, we define it more broadly and we're really fostering a diverse and inclusive organization. That is the goal. And, and, and certainly we still have work to do. But I can just say, like, just over la just just last week, we we brought in a, a global DNI uh, leader, thought leader, Dr. Shirley Davis. I don't know if anyone knows her, but you know, we offered this up to all the employees of the organization in the U.S. over 4,000 people, and the focus was on unconscious bias and its impact on the workforce. And I can tell you that was meaningful. So it, it starts as an organization, anyway, that, that I represent here in the U.S. It starts more holistically, and then there's you know specifics like clinical trial. Uh, components that, that we're also working on. That's well said, and it, it's, an, it's an initiative that we all need to take, right? Um, and I, I'm, I'm glad you guys are at the forefront of that. Um, we spent a lot of time on the front end and at the top of the funnel here in terms of clinical trial diversity and how to, how to do it. The flip side is just as important, which is, you know, once the drugs are out there in the market, how do, how do, how do folks afford them? Um, and it's, uh, it, it's a problem that it's, it's, it's been there for, uh, you know, for a long time, it's been part of the political conversation up and down. And um, there are initiatives here that are happening too. And I think this is an important part of this conversation. Um, you know, Doug, I'll, I'll go back to you, you know, for a second here to talk about from the big pharma perspective, as you think about the intersection of diversity, you know, approved drugs, affordability, you know, how, you know what, 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 have, what have you seen on the forefront there? What, what have you all done? And what do you think is going to happen in, in the future there to kind of, you know, keep, keep pushing the ball forward? Well, I can tell you, Amber, I think it's top of mind for every CEO of every life science company. It's not just selling drugs. It's, it's can people and patients afford them. And one of the things I think we need to do is take a look at the patient experience. So if they're, in essence, trying to manage, in our case, some chronic diseases, do they even have access to a physician? And are they using maybe an emergency room as their physician? And you know that's not good for the healthcare system, and certainly not good for, for the patient care. So I know as as an organization, affordability is critically critically important, and and we've offered a, a suite of offerings for for patients that are either inside the system or outside the system. So whether or not they're in a Medicaid, Medicare, uh, government insurance, a high deductible health plan, if they have commercial insurance and they still can't afford the medications. There's a wide variety of programs that, that we offer that can help. And I think that uh, there is a significant uh, effort that needs to be, uh, you know, I, I think, put forth. And, and, and we're trying to lead by example in that regard. I know a lot of other companies are doing some really good things, but even in COVID, we, we offered a patient assistance program and we, we renewed it this year for another six months, offered it all last year for those that were affected by COVID and could have lost their insurance and can't afford their insulin. So that's really, really important to us. And I think we need to really think about the holistic patient care. And if patients uh, can't afford their medications, what as an industry and, and for us as a company can we do to help? Thanks, Doug. Any other thoughts around, around, um, around this topic from, from Cynthia, Carrie, Allison? You know, we welcome how, how, how folks are thinking about the affordability side of this. I'd be happy to just quickly chime in from the broader McKesson perspective. You know, certainly we're a supply chain company at our core, um, but there's a lot more that goes into it from a patient perspective that many may not realize in support of Novo and other, you know, big pharma. You know, our hope is to really support initiation on therapy and persistence. And there's a certainly a financial component to that. Um, it's helping on the administrative side. I think many patients who are facing chronic conditions in particular and high and are prescribed high cost drugs have dealt with the, the feeling of pushing paper around, waiting for the phone call, the drugs not, the prescription wasn't filled because the paperwork wasn't complete and having to do this game of telephone truly to get that process to be completed. And so what are the solutions that players like McKesson can bring to our pharma partners, our pharmacy 
partners and customers and ultimately to prescribers and patients and payers, truly all of the, the right stakeholders, to make these processes as efficient as possible, to put the focus back on the patient need, support them both financially and clinically, and do that as seamlessly as possible. I think maybe in the past, much more of the emphasis was around the financial. If the patient had the information to know an assistance program was available or a copay card or a discount card was available, but that puts a lot on the patient to have to know and ask. So how can we bring it to them? Again, back to these themes of data or technology, what can we leverage to bring that to the patient much more thoughtfully and then be there for them and partner with them along the way as they go back to refill? What are their barriers to, re to picking up in the first place or to refilling? Are they clinical? Are they financial? So I, you know, I'm very optimistic and proud, frankly, to work for a company like McKesson where so much of the dialogue now is truly, you know, things like access for more patients and what in, what goes into it is a lot of what's been referenced here. So I'm optimistic we'll continue to see the financial and the clinical help to address some of the barriers that um, patients are facing around affordability and access. Makes sense. And I maybe just one um, comment to add to, to Carrie's. You know, I really see another shift in so much as you know, we're all very well aware of the silos that exist um, within pharma companies and, uh, you know, from an R&D to Metafairs to commercial, et cetera. You know, there, there is a shifting that is occurring relative to molecule to market patient insights that instead of thinking about this as a linear clinical development cycle, thinking about it as a virtual cycle of evidentiary requirement. So we're seeing actually clinical development plans being built with, in fact, those end, um, um, how shall I say, challenges in mind, patient access, what payer uh, data requirements, regulator, policymaker, uh, patients, uh, you know, data sets, and being able to more deliberately plan. And in fact, patient insights, importantly, as Carrie was alluding to, being able to harness those insights at the very beginning, the patient voice, and carrying those insights all the way through access, understanding why certain uh, diverse populations or certain subpopulations are adherent or non-compliant to drug, uh, it, it, and taking those insights and actually funneling them back to the design table and understanding it, you know, the, the, the patient journey better. It's, it's, Cynthia, that, that's such a powerful concept. Allison, I wanna to get to you in a second, but that was such a powerful concept. Can, 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 you, can, you, can you give an example of that? Because gosh, like, I, I feel like you know, one of the things that I've, I've seen is, is missing you know, overall is, is a feedback loop, right? You know, how do you actually you know, get, get some data points back from, from the converse, you know, from the, from the market side, back to the clinical trial side and, and you get that going. And what you just, what you described was just, uh, is, is a really, really interesting way of doing that. And are, are there, are there examples yet, or is this still in the forefront yeah. of what's happening? No, it's, it's, it, it was our own self-reflection, um, a, a number of years ago that, you know, we're designing, you know, patient voice, patient insights on the R and D front, we're designing it in real world late phase and all the commercial group likewise. And, and, and with our own left hand, right hand, how do we do this at scale? Uh, that's gonna en enable us to gather insights with speed and cost sensitivity uh, to really help us design better, deliver better. And, and of course on the commercialization front. So in, in fact, developing a big data factory of insights that are, you know, is cloud-based on a platform where there's an overlay of analytics, uh, machine learning. And in fact, you know, it's, it's, it's the same insights, it's the same data. The use case is what has changed. And so being able to provide those digital tools and applications for the usability um, of the, these insights and being, you know, smarter in design and smarter in delivery. And of course, on the commercialization front. Yeah, that's fantastic. Allison, any thoughts from your end here? Sure, real quick, um, I'll just cut to the chase. Uh, for me, affordability takes on a new meaning when you superimpose the fact that the commercialization process and the clinical care process is leaving egregious gaps in evidentiary data. When we begin to draw sharper lines between what is proven and in whom, 
we can deliver more meaningful narratives to those communities who need it most about how we get there. Yeah, and, and so maybe expand on that. So how, so how, how would you help address that? You know, given, 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 that, given, that, given that issue you pointed out? Well, there are a, a plethora of different ways to get into the community and, and bring messages about uh, how these things are connected, how we connect the dots, what it means to participate in a clinical trial, what it means to, to be represented and to have uh, evidence-based medicine you can rely on um, as you access your healthcare but making something affordable that hasn't been proven safe and effective on all patient populations um, just rings hollow to me. Uh, these issues cannot be separated, but must be taken on as a unit, in my opinion. Yeah, so it sounds, sounds very, very consistent, you know, with, with a, lot of the, a lot of the other panelists here in terms of thinking about, you know, how do you connect these two different points, which um, at first seemed like different conversations, right? They're actually part of the same exact conversation. I think that, that was a great yeah. job summarizing that. You know, I, I'm running short on time. Um, you know, la last, last question here before any final thoughts any, any panelists have. Um, you know, as, as you think about, a, a few of you have, have mentioned, the, you know, regulators, the federal government, you know, uh, as, you know, as part of this, a few of you have mentioned industry trade organizations. I think what both of those indicate you know, a potential desire or need for an industry-based or government-based solution. One can debate which one, um, which one will be faster and more effective. Um, but as you think about the role of that, you know, one, one proposal, you know, that, that was mentioned was, you know, a grading system for clinical trials, you know, where diversity would be part of that, the patient experience would be part of that, um, maybe the affordability of a drug would be part of that. H how do you think about the, the concept of whether it's a, it's a report card or some other, some other way of, of ranking, um, you know, where, where things stand, you know, how, how, where, where does that conversation sit today? You know, it, it, whether it's in, whether in trade groups within, within big companies or, or within kind of the policy makers, you know, I'm, I'm curious where, where, where folks are in, in that, um, in that world. Maybe I'll start, start, maybe I'll start with Doug. I mean, you're on pharma, you know, like, how, like where, I imagine industry-based solutions are always better than, uh, than than regulatory ones. Is it would be my my first inclination of it. Uh, but uh, but I'm, I'm yeah. We typically we typically are supportive of a market-based or in, well we call them market-based solutions. Um, in general, we, we do feel like those are better. And uh, that's an interesting you know uh, question. And I don't know we're we're a highly regulated industry, and and certainly you know clinical trials are a component of that. And 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 I think that the, the measurement of that. Um, is not something that I don't believe we'd shy away from, but, but generally speaking, we're of the mindset of market-based solutions being the most productive in the end. Yeah. Yep. I don't know, Carrie, Allison, Cynthia. Well, I, I think that in virtually every other aspect of our lives, we're able to view and to offer feedback about our experiences. Airbnb, uh, Uber and Lyft, restaurants on Yelp, you name it. Why shouldn't there be a place for patient reviews and, and greater transparency? I think that it's only a win-win because not only does it help keep industry um, open and honest and transparent um, and, and the larger medical research endeavor honest and open and transparent, but it also reinforces the concept in the minds of minorities and anyone else who might be initially hesitant that the travesties of the past cannot easily be repeated. Having more eyes on this process and on those conducting studies confers peace of mind. How could it not? It, it would suggest that there is nothing to hide and issues of privacy and conf confidentiality um, could be mitigated. But first and foremost, by patients who are the ones who'd be raising their hands and opting in to share those experiences. This is already being done on a broader basis with patient advocacy groups where patients openly discuss their health journeys. Sharing these reviews about sites, about studies from the patient perspective would simply be an extension of what patient advocates are already engaging in. There's yeah, nothing you know preventing 
study participants from doing it now. It's just not done in any systematic way. Yeah, maybe we'll use it as a way to wrap up. You know, I, um, you know, a few a few months ago, I got pitched by a company that was was doing something that that folks were talking about today, which was allowing allowing folks to rate their experience of going going to a clinical clinical trial site. And it was really interesting. Like some of the feedback um, was, you know, very very tactical. Actually, it was, gosh, like the the clinical trial site closed at four. If they just stayed open till five, I'd be able to make it. Another one was, gosh, the parking lot was really far mm -hmm. from where it was. If they just had a valet, so I'd not have to spend 10 minutes looking for parking, this happened. And so like very tactical things that actually allowed sites to recruit, um, you know, pharma companies to recruit faster, less, less dropouts uh, for these, you know, for the private, you know, for, um, for, the, for, the, for the sites actually to enroll more patients right. and have more longitudinal thing, and for the patients to be heard. Um, and I think, if you think about all of those things uh, uh, coming together, you know, I think that it speaks to the patient voice. It speaks to how, uh, you know, there, there, are, there is innovation that is technology driven that is at the forefront of how, of, of how we're thinking about um, diversity and recruiting new patients, keeping them enrolled in trials. And as people have talked about here, tying that to the affordability of these drugs once they're on the market. And so, um, you know, I'll, you know, maybe, maybe we'll wrap up with that, with that comment. Um, but just from my perspective, this has been just a tremendous conversation, uh, between everyone here, so many different perspectives, you know, from the industry, from the patient, from people who used to run clinical trials, uh, from CROs. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm really, really happy we had this. Thank you all for, for your perspectives and, Thank uh, you. you know, looking forward to keeping in touch with all of you as, as we solve this problem in the coming decade. Thank you all. Solve it. Thank you. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. A pleasure. Thank you very yeah. much, um, Ambor. Thank you to the panel. Um, I did have a question for Allison. Um, Allison, obviously, I cover healthcare, but um, I am also a manager in my in my own company. And so there was a situation a year ago or so where there was a position open, and I really wanted to get a journalist of color. And so I, you know did the usual, I did an ad on journalismjobs.com and I got a bunch of applications, none of which were minority or if they were, they were brown and I really wanted to, to hire a black journalist. So then I thought, okay, I'm not trying hard enough. Okay. I need to reach out uh, to the NABJ, National Association of Black Journalists. I reached out. That's gonna be my suggestion. <laughs> I, did not, <laughs> I did not hear back. I did not hear back from this uh, similar association representing LGBTQ journalists. So if I'm a small pharma startup mm -hmm. and I feel like, okay, I've done this to check the box. How do people find people like you? I mean, absent a mandate, uh, if there are people that feel like, okay, I've done enough, but I, I really can't reach these people. How does, how does it change? Call me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have enough time to go through the litany of options, but there are many okay. and don't give up, uh, stay in the fight. <laughs> we can do this together, but it, it may take some slogging through. So it, depends, you it depends on the location. It depends on a lot of different factors, obviously. So when you say that there are people ready to be engaged, it's just, we have to try harder. That's what you're suggesting. You have to try harder. You have to make your presence known. Um, for the life of me, I do not and cannot understand why pharma, pharma as a whole hasn't engaged in a collective campaign just to say, hey, clinical trials are cool. This is what we do. This is why we do it. And this is how it works. Right, right. Well, there's so much to learn. So thank you all. This was a very engaging discussion. Uh, I appreciate all your thoughts. Um, and just uh, as a quick reminder, we have our pitch contest later on this um, afternoon at 3.30 Eastern, where, we'll, uh, where we will have six diagnostic startups pitch. So I hope to see some of you back here. Take care and bye-bye.